true, your mission mark, should you decide to accept it, is to move terabytes of data and get this Cold Fusion app off this ISP and have a disaster recovery site in the cloud. Should you fail in this mission, the secretary will disavow what you have done and you will be kicked out of the Cold Fusion community. <laughs> This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Good luck, Mark. <laughs> well, now that's that. Julio. Welcome back to the show. Today, we're looking at planning for a CFML ISP disaster and how Command Box and Docker came to the rescue. And I'm here with Mark Drew, and he is the host of He's the host of this very famous podcast called localhost.fm. Yeah, the and local host podcast. The yeah. local host podcast. And he has been doing Cold Fusion since 1969 or Something maybe like somewhat more recently. Maybe it was 1996. 69, 96 was the difference, you know? Yeah. It's just a parity era. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, his company's... Uh, Command HQ has done amazing things for well-known brands in the UK like Jaeger and Hobbs and Dyson and BMW and or B and W, not BMW. BMW got yeah. an extra letter in there, yeah. uh, among others. So, I think we should start this episode with a somewhat spoof uh, beginning, uh, because really you were given a very challenging task to do to move this mega site. Uh, yeah. And get, provide some disaster recovery. So I, I've got some appropriate uh, music we can play here. Yes, it's Mission Impossible. And here we have our agent, Mark Drew. Your mission, Mark, should you decide to accept it, is to move terabytes of data and get this Cold Fusion app off this ISP and have a disaster recovery site in the cloud. Should you fail in this mission, the secretary will disavow what you have done and you will be kicked out of the Cold Fusion community. <laughs> this message will self-destruct in five seconds. Good luck, Mark. <laughs> well, now that's, that's an impossible mission force to the rescue. Yes, the impossible Cold Fusion force. Yeah. <laughs> so, but seriously, you, you had a big app. It, it was written in Rilo. CFML. Yeah. I mean, um, it is, and yeah. Yeah. Tell us about it. What, what was the challenge here? Um, I can't say who the client is because they haven't cleared it. I'll hopefully get it cleared by the time I, we do the presentation in into the box at the end of April. Um, but yeah, so basically they're a digital asset management app. So, you know, you can upload all your uh, various source files. So like illustrator files and, things like that and then have a management of how they live you know the tasks that you have to do with them and print out and what have you um and yeah this had grown for many years as usual there's a lot of apps that are older than you think you know um and this had gone from being run on cold fusion and then it moved to rilo it's now moving to lucy uh but yeah so we originally came in because we wanted they wanted us to help on various parts and one of the parts was the disaster recovery environment right so in case anything goes wrong we were like tied to this bit of tin right or several bits of tin but or v vms at an isp but still running on you know actual bits of tin um but then the isp said that they had to move so we had a few months to actually <laughs> implement this what speed up this this disaster recovery they were going to what, what do you what do you mean the isp had to move they were going to close that data center or something or? yeah exactly oh. i think it was in the center of london they had to move i don't know the details but uh yeah they had to move so we had to move literally it, i mean we had a few months they, they weren't like oh we're moving next week you gotta get your kid out but we had some time but then we had to like really look at this and the environment was incredibly it still is uh, complex it's not as you might imagine, just one app. It, it was several different servers. It was servers that were running Java, PHP, various different codes for different functions. 
there was uh, an odd server in there that was like a Windows machine that had InDesign installed that would run a scheduled task on that machine to convert InDesign files to PDFs and to, to images. And that was the only way that you could do it. You know, it was like literally a macro running on that machine. So you couldn't get it out as easily as you wanted. So we had this melange of servers as you could in this environment. And to add to the problem is that we had a non-trivial amount of data to move around. We had terabytes. How, how much data? I might be getting this wrong, but it's about 30 terabytes. And this was Quite usable data. This, mm. this, this wasn't stuff that was just like, like a backup you could put on a tape. Um, you needed, this had to be usable because it's people's files, right? It's, people, it's mm. like, like, you know, if you imagine something like Dropbox or something like that, you can't just go, well, we're just half your files out of, you know, whilst we're moving them over to, to S3 on a, on a USB disk, they're being changed live. So, so how much down, downtime were you allowed to have between, in this move scenario? Not, none, really, because we have various clients mm. and you couldn't tell all the clients that we're going to move. I mean, we, haven't, we are transitioning. We're still in the process of transitioning, mm. but we're nearly at the stage. If you, we can just now uh, switch to DNS and it will work. But... Mm. Um, we haven't transitioned yet because they ha haven't kicked us out yet, but we're that, nearly there. Um, and yeah. How, so, how on earth, just to jump ahead, how on earth would you test whether just changing the DNS would actually work? <laughs> you use host files. So you can actually just do a host file because like you type okay. in www.mysite.com. Oh, okay. If you change it in your yes. host file, you know, so you can so you do can, it that way. Right. So you can thoroughly test the, 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 the backup version in the cloud. Yeah. Does the exact same thing. Yeah, exactly. So we've been doing that and we can then load test that and see, well, okay, so do we have, so we've moved to the cloud. All oh, this is great, but does it handle the load? Does it handle the applications? We also have a guy called Bob that tests a lot. So he mm. literally sits there testing and trying to break the application quite, I would say maliciously, mm. but he does a very good job at breaking mm. Which is good because then we and, and was there any other reason they wanted to to have this backup copy or? Well, as part of the backup copy was was a bit of changes because we actually hosted, as I said, we were actually hosted on Rilo in some of the engines, and we needed to move to. We had different, completely different environments. Rilo as a company did, and as a project kind of disappeared. So there's no updates. The developers wanted to do you know, do new features and things like that, that we couldn't deploy into Rilo. So what ended up happening was like the developers were developing on one version, like you know, on Lucy because it was updated, etc. And in our mind's eye, having to test it on really test it again for regression, you know, mm. uh, until we could actually change the whole environment. And we had to like test it end to end. I mean, there is, it's a, pretty old application so there's various nooks and crannies that that certain clients would use because this is this is a software as a service kind of thing with yep. some caveats for various different clients that they used one part of the application more than other clients use other. And, and it was a multiple mul multiple applications so um the main topic is digital asset management but there's various different functions around that so yeah so <laughs> so how, where did you start with this? Because it sounds like, a, a, you know, you, you, you worked about a year on this. Is that right? Or? Um, on and off, yeah. I mean, I worked on the, the infrastructure team at that company worked for about a year on this. Um, mm. And I came in and kind of guided some of the efforts on that. Um, basically, I was the audience throwing popcorn saying, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> but, you know, th and they did some awesome work with, with that. And once what really sped up a lot of the progress was move a moving away from the developers moving away from using vagrant as their build environments to start using um docker so we mm -hmm. started, so then we could do more complete environment so kind of what i've been you know doing some presentations but actually what the truth of it is is that is it's kind of like these presentations fall in the, the sequence of the workflow Mm. So the workflow starts with like developer machines because that's very easy to change and it doesn't matter if the developer is, 
is is or well, it does matter if they they have downtime, but it's not it's not as important as compared to a live system. You know that the the consequences are not as big. And then looking at the testing environment to make sure that our test and staging environments are are, are important are, are working well, and then you can move on to the live environment, right? But that's got slightly different requirements and than the other two, but you can solve a lot of problems by having a pipeline across those environments. Hmm. And if you've got in, on completely different environments at each of the stages, it's very complex. And that's the situation. Yes. That so that's where they were currently, but you know, before this move that dev yeah. staging and production were all different kind of environments. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of things that you, you kind of like went, Oh, well, Oh, so you're using the, the development version of this one but you're using it in staging, right? And, you know, and, and all of this. So uh, at the beginning, what we had to solve was the actual workflow of how version control got deployed. Mm. So that was one of the, 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 the key stages of that, rather than the environment and the deployment that we're talking about today. But that was mm. actually one of the key problems of solving it with um, the, 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 you know, deployment pipeline that we had. So... Mm. We solved how the code gets from from a development straight out. Um, that we started adding tests. Um, we added a bit of linting, but the code was fairly old, and it was it, it was like, well, you have to take a pragmatic view. We're gonna like change all this code because it does doesn't pass our linting, or shall we just focus on the code that we're actually using? Um, this application also has a lot of of users on it. But there's a new application being built, so you know it's kind of like, well, let's focus on 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 impactful wins. So to speak. I, I've heard there's a there's a tool coming out that will tell you coverage of your code. I, I think Integral have some uh -huh. thing in their in their cloud uh, Fusion Reactor yeah. thing that may be going to do that in the future. I'm pretty sure David Tallisall mentioned yeah, something to that I, effect. I think that that tied in with Command Box as well. I saw something. Yeah. CF Camp a couple of years ago, or last year, I can't remember. Because uh, that was getting to me. Time, you know, it's, yeah. it's just elastic. I'm, I mean, that uh, time is elastic. That would be really handy with this kind of legacy code, where you know only right. eight, eight, you know, so much of the code is run. Maybe fifty percent of the code actually is used. Yeah, I mean, Lucy at one point, or Rilo, I think at one point had some code measurement stuff like that i was trying to build an interface to it because this actually generates a lot of data like mm -hmm. um because it's not just usage it's like heat maps about you know which mm -hmm. code is running slow and stuff like that right so is is that's a lot of data to deal with when you yes. think that you have a, a a 10 year old application that has three hundred thousand lines of code for example i can't remember how many lines of code this this application has but once you have that, it's like great. Okay, I know which which parts are not uh, uh, um, more lightly used, but they're still being used. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> it's, it's it's okay. It's, it's a good thing, but it's not the be all and end all. You know, I do love it for real applications because then you can see where where your test coverage is getting at, rather mm -hmm. than usage. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's important because if you haven't tested some code, chances are that's where the remaining bugs are lurking. Yeah, exactly. And one of the, I mean, on my day-to-day -day consultancy stuff, sometimes the problem is finding out, okay, so there's this CFM file that, that doesn't get used, right? What's calling it and how would it be called? Some systems are very dynamic and they're dynamic from based on data, for example. Like I've seen people like do, that they have a database of all the pages that are actually being called and includes that comes from a data, for example, right? So I know people are screaming at me, but you can just do find and, and you know, do a, a, a multi-file find. Yeah, it doesn't always happen like that. So, yeah, you might find that file that's not called once, but, but it might get called. But, yeah, if you can get that kind of information, it, it's, it's really, really, really good. Um, so t tell us the, the, what you used for your source control and continuous integration. What, which software did you end up picking and why? Um, so we had Jenkins already running there and they were using GitLab, an mm -hmm. old version of GitLab, which they were just using it like a, like a Git repository. So mm. they had Bitbucket and GitLab where we've now moved to, because the, the, the problem with Jenkins 
is that you cannot script your deployment process, right? So this mm. is a thing that you'd go like, here's my job and here's all the things that it does. Uh, uh, but you don't have a nice um, scriptable way to say that these are the pipelines. This is what happens. Now in the newer versions of GitLab, uh, you have that. You can say, this is my, my pipeline across different environments. And I can say, for example, if you are using version control, you can say all of the depl depl um, develop branch stuff goes straight to the de uh, development servers and you can have a whole environment that, that clients can test, for example. And that goes to, let's say, all the way to staging so clients can, so, so you can actually test kind of like real data against your code or something like that, right? or a mirror of the, the, the real data. Um, Bitbucket as well now has pipelines, but because we were like, it, it's all being kept in-house in uh, that, and the other teams were using GitLab already because they started from scratch so they could choose whatever they want. Um, but now we've moved to GitLab. So... That that's the current GitLab. Uh, Jenkins has got a few of the tasks, I think, which is running uh, data migration pipelines. So basically, the way you have GitLab set up, you you commit some files uh, as having changed, and it automatically mm -hmm. gets sent off to staging, and then when it passes yeah. the appropriate tests, it, it, it kind of can... actually uh, our our workflow is slightly different. Um, mm because we're using Docker. So what happens is that if you commit to develop, it actually creates an image. Mm. So we have our own Docker image. So it actually like takes it out, does a Docker build, which we now have an image and it pushes that to our, uh, uh image repository. And then that can be loaded wherever you want it. It could be loaded exactly. to staging development production. Yeah. Exactly. Far, just, far side of the moon. Yeah. Anywhere you can have a Docker container run. Yeah. Yeah, probably your, laptop, your your mobile phone in the next few years is going to have like a Docker app or something in there that you could probably run it in. There yeah, you so go. You can, so you can just do Docker run from wherever you want it to do. Um, so that's essentially what's hap more happening rather than files being moved across to servers. It's more like containers are being done and then Kubernetes, which is what they're using for the orchestration, then that picks up the changes however they are doing it. I don't know precisely how they're doing the 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 reloading of that but there's very very strategies that you can do so what what, what stages does your build go through so what we're trying to get to so is, this is a, a continual improvement right so we've got basically because command box you can actually put pre-commit hooks so if you do a git commit before that it'll actually trigger something in your build file in your uh, box.json file, you can say these are the things that I want it to actually run. So it actually runs um, our test box tests before you can even commit it. If they fail, you can't commit the code. So that's kind of like stage one at the developer end, right? I would love it to for it to run CF Lint. And if there is a fusion reactor, like code coverage to say, well, actually this code isn't, you know, I've just run some tests and this code wasn't covered. So go write tests that covers this code. That'll be brilliant, but we're not there yet. So after it's, it's done that, it actually builds the image. And obviously the test is that that image is built, you know, so it, there's no errors in, in building it. And, you know, the exit code is zero. Uh, and then that gets deployed to the, we call it development, but there's, there should be a better name. Um, yeah, so there's a development server that is then used for, by the QA team. So they go and, and modify that. And then once it passes that, it can go into master, which then will get deployed to staging environment, which is basically kind of a copy of live. So this QA2 with real data type thing, um, which gets like refreshed every night or something. It's not automatic. It's more of a like, okay, a weekly thing. We're about to do our weekly release. Let's do that. Right. Um, and then, you know, you can do the actual load testing and external testing on that environment. Um, and the inter external testing is Bob or is that some automated? That is a client. Oh, no, that's client. a client. <laughs> okay. The testing is actually the client going, yes, we understand that this is 
not the real thing and this is mm. what we wanted or this is what what's mm-hmm. coming up you know we we have some um I'm, I'm, the word is missing, but some very friendly clients that mean that they are looking at the product. They're very invested in the product. So they, they are, you know, they get like previews of the build so they can, they can actually work on it. So, mm. and then is the load testing, is that some scripts that are automated? We, you, you just run uh, through yeah, it for a, the, the, an hour or two. Yeah, we are still working on those. We're looking at JMeter. Uh, that's the kind of thing. Um, w- the problem is, is that this is an app and not a not a web web page. So as you ca- so you have to do a lot of workflows, and you don't need to do that much testing of the load. And the load is not as you'd imagine it, like fifty requests, a hundred requests, because that's not the load. It's generally uh, uploading a very big file and waiting for it to be turned into a PDF and into something. Mm. And then the other load parts of the system is um, you're able to select multiple files and then download a zip. So is that generating that zip? So our loads are slightly different to to what everybody expects as load. You know. Mm. Uh, so we're still working on on how we can get that just right so we can get nice expectations because it's not the the measurement of like you know you know milliseconds to the first byte and milliseconds to to you know like the full page render and things like that that's not uh the loads that we're looking at we're looking at for example um how you display a table with like 50 or 100 columns right Mm -hmm. um even though you're paginating it and how you paginate through that so you you for the server you're running fusion reactor to monitor it or fusion reactor cloud or what right what so that's that's there? for the for the live one so that so we're doing a couple of things so one of the problems with docker is it's ephemeral right so if you have a um a server keel over that server's gone <laughs> it's not there anymore you can't go into the logs and find out why so um, we use Fusion Reactor to monitor them a lot. Uh, it's mainly to to it's generally to to monitor the SQL behavior, right? Um, how how the queries are doing. If we need to add more indexes or what have you. Um, so we've been using Fusion Reactor Cloud um, because then we can just pump everything there and we can kind of get an idea of which ones are. are uh, you know how how the servers are behaving but we're also doing our own logging and that's a quite of important thing for, for mm. docker um so we're using a, a thing called the elk stack or the open source elastic stack i think they've renamed themselves which is a combination of three products uh one is elastic search which is basically a NoSQL database that obviously by the name of it called search and basically you can put like nearly anything into it and, and you can query it right uh then you have another product called log stash which is by the name is a good way of throwing in logs right you know you can put it, it mm-hmm. accepts logs in various different formats and it's got a little pro, um, way of you writing and defining how logs are defined and kibana is um a nice dashboard application so you can create different dashboards uh, based on the data that you now have in Elasticsearch. So you can say, give me all the errors from the application because, uh, or, or uh, how many mail errors you have, right? And you can have a nice dashboard showing you mail errors per second, something like that. If you have, Hopefully you have zero, but this, <laughs> we have that. And journal D is a way of, of piping up to gather all those, those different logs from different servers and pump them up out to elk to the elastic, um, elastic stack it's, it's got a new name. It was, it's always been called elk, but now they added, I think another time series data ingester or something like that. So mm. now they, they have to give it a fancy name. So basically this lets you see how each of the Docker instances are performing. And if there are problems, you could hopefully figure out what was killing it. Right. Because the logs are not permanent. So unless you start putting permanent logs on, on whichever machine, but then you, then it becomes this like 
hide and seek and or looking for a needle in a, a very very huge haystack um one of the problems i guess of lucy and cold fusion and have that that were the benefits before is the fact that the log files are kind of quite hidden away in the machine um so you know application.log and the exception.log etc cetera, etc cetera. so what you want is all these logs that were now nicely that you go into an admin but you don't know which machine you're going to especially since literally we don't know which machine we're going to when we go to the website because we're doing round robin Mm. So each time you hit a machine, you're hitting a different machine. So even if I went uh. into the admin and went go to admin, oh, go to admin, log in again. I've now logged into each of the servers that I'm circling around mm. and looked at the application log. I might not be looking at the application log of the server that that keeled over or had an issue. You know, why? Why did you choose to do round robin as opposed to sticky session? Uh, each request is completely different. So. Mm. Um, you're not stuck to a server when you're getting a request. So mm -hmm. we split out the servers more by clients. So low, low intensity clients get less amount of instances, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but each request um, builds up a, a, an environment for that client. I don't, mm. I'm not sure if I'm explaining myself. So if you were, if we were providing the service for client A, B or C, they could run through the code and it would appear to client A, so, so it would appear differently to client A to client B, but they're running through the same exact code. Mm. Does that make sense? So there isn't, we don't have like a client A servers or client B servers specifically, but the branding changes and the behavior changes is all based on configuration. So every request is based on configuration. So we have those configuration cached and, and what have you. What in essence means is that every server can serve everyone equally. It's very democratic mm. that way. Mm. <laughs> and hopefully gives better performance and reliability. Right. So each request, you know, you'd go there and, and it'd be hot. it behaves pretty well. Um, we try not to do sticky sessions. And what we've been doing is using um, uh, memcached to store sessions before we're using database, but now memcached is a lot faster. Uh, and we can just do it like that. Um, what's really good and has changed a lot of the, you know, a lot of the problems that we've had with Core Fusion and Lucy and Rilo and to be honest with you, everything else is the fact that we have something that no other program had before, which was like the administrator or the Lucy admin or something where, where to add your data sources and where to add your cache servers and, and things like that. And that was good. But in these type of environments, it's terrible because I'm not going to go to that machine and set it up, right? It has to be all set up. Um, previously, we're, what we were doing was doing these uh, XML files, which are the, the Lucy stores its configuration in XML files. So we'd just chuck them in and pre-warm it and do its thing. And then that's that server all configured. Nowadays, Lucy's moving a lot more to, um, you know, environment-based configuration and there's a great great uh, extension to command box called cfconfig which means that you because we're actually running everything through command box so command box is actually the the, the server so instead of tomcat we're now using command box and cfconfig and command box what, what cfconfig allows you to do is to get the full admin configuration of that server into a file so when you start up the command box server it actually slurps that file and that's your configuration, right? So you're able to manually change so, that. So effectively you can script the configuration. Right, right. And you can pass variables to it through the environment variables that you, because that's what you generally inject into, into Docker containers. So this, this guarantees that all the different Docker containers, whether in, they're in development staging or production, all have exactly the same configuration and data sources. Right, yeah. And one of the big things that we've actually been doing in configuration, one of the big solutions that we've come to is actually counterintuitive, but is, for example, um, you have one server that's your, one database server, right? And in your development environment, you created a data source that points to that development server, which is your development at markdrew.com. Oh, sorry, there's a terrible domain. Development.markdrew.io, right? So that's the, 
the, the URL to that development server. Then when you go live, you have to change that, right, to production.markdrew.io as a development server, right? Which is, okay, is, is good. We've been doing this for ages. But it means that now there's one thing that we have to change, like within, somewhere within our code, right? Mm. Uh, or you have some code in your, in your application.cfc that says, if it's production, use these servers. If it's, if it's uh, you know, uh, development, use these other servers. Uh, and that goes for like your mail server that goes because you don't want to send stuff out to people right in from your development environment and it, that goes for any external resource starts becoming this thing that that you have like something to swap out mm. this so, is not a good thing <laughs> yeah so what so we, you, you you have some server environment variables that that keep track of this or how are you doing well, that well actually we have some server environment variables that keep track of a few things uh to say whether it's a production or, or other type of environment for for caching purposes but what we've been doing for external resources was coming up with a generic name for them mm. so database that's the name of it that's the domain that we use for all of our databases so whether you're in production whether you are in testing or whether you are in um, development database is the name of the database server, right? Now we might pass in usernames and passwords via the environment variables, but the, the, the host of the database is that, right? Um, and for the mail server, it's like mail server, right? So if you looked at my config in development, it says mail server, port, whatever, username comes from the environment. Um, so what we can then do is actually chase the, the, change the, the host's file to point to the right thing in the right environment. So my development machine, the host file points to the development host. On the live machine, the, the, the host for mail server points to the actual mail server rather than to the, to the mail trap that we have. So that's actually then reduced a whole bunch of code that we have all over the place because you just go, Right. What? What's you know? When people ask you what's the mail server, you just t say it's a mail server. <laughs> just use mail server. So that and for example, the memcache stuff. You know, when you need to put like, well, which is the 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 caching server's URL address, right? You, I think everyone's joining in, and the, all the audience is now going to shout out is you know, cache server. That's <laughs> or, or whatever the, the domain is, right? So you can all manage it with your host file. The host file, you know, maps IPs to 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 host names. So now, where, where's this host file living? Inside the Docker container? Or? No, it would be on the host machine. You can you could put it into the into inside the. You don't need to actually even put it inside the Docker container because you can pass these as variables. So mm. in Docker Compose, you can say these are the hosts. So memcached mm -hmm. points to one, two, three, four, five. You know. That's a really wrong IP address. One two seven dot dot zero dot zero dot one, right? Um, and if you're just running Docker by itself, you can actually also put these are these are at your host mappings. So you control that from externally, right? This is up to infrastructure to 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 handle all these mappings and 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 they have their build scripts that now are in. And everything else. So now you can change it in one place rather than saying, oh, in the code, could you change the fact that this domain is somewhere else? Well, Very clever. So it's been quite interesting um, getting to this stage that we've been able to like, okay, so how can we ease the pain here? How can we get rid of as much configuration as possible? And now configuration now means different things for us because it now means what features does a client have? So when they use the system, can they access, you know, feature A and feature B? And then that becomes a licensing thing rather than a, than a infrastructure thing. Because infrastructure should be outside and handled by infrastructure, the infrastructure team and how Docker is deployed and how Kubernetes is, is configured rather than as developers. That part anyway. So how are you managing all these Docker instances? Because it sounds quite confusing. Oh, well, the orchestration at the moment is being doing, done by Kubernetes. So we've, we don't use Minikube for the development environment, which is how you'd kind of do it. They use Kubernetes for the live stuff. I don't have full knowledge of that because I haven't played, played around with it. They try to keep, you know, 
people like me away from that kind of stuff, but we, we come up with strategies on how to actually use it. For the developers, we're using uh, Docker Compose. Now, Docker Compose is a nice way of composing a full-on environment. So, I don't know if, do you remember Cluster Cats back in the Spectra days? Yeah. Right? Yes. And do you remember like just getting two servers, like, <laughs> you know, like, so you could check out a load balanced environment. That was, I, I still have headaches. I think I've lost all my hair because of that. I'm going to blame Cluster Cats for, for the, that configuration, right? And now literally I can get environments for, for the developers that they can see how the application works when you're doing round robin or when you're doing, uh, you know, sticky sessions, literally whilst you're developing. Mm. Right? So, you can, so they can see how that's working. And we're doing that using Docker Compose. Um, and they can see it in, in action, so to speak, you know. And you can then scale it, say, all right, so, yeah, great, you've got two servers, and this looks like it's working. What happens when we have to scale to 50, right? And you can just literally like, rescale it up to 50, and it does it, and all the servers come up, and you can see the latency between them, and you can see what happens when maybe a server doesn't come up because you mm -hmm. don't have enough RAM on your machine or whatever, and what happens with that, right? So you might have to, like, put up a, you know, a way to... to in your software, we don't have to do much of this, but you know, it allows you to develop in a more realistic environment, you know, or, or an environment behave, that behaves more realistically. Right, which means you're going to get less uh, bugs that only show up in production because oh. development is really the same as production. Oh God, yeah. I mean, there's so many bugs that are like, uh, you know, this only happens on a Wednesday, and and it's like, hey. Bob, can you come over here? It only happens on my machine when I do the specific sequence of events. And then you can't replicate it at all. And us developers love when we can replicate something because then it's true and we can fix it. <coughs> yes. I mean, if, if a bug occurs in the forest and can't be replicated, is it really a bug? You know? No, it's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> so d tell me how you handle data changes and workflow in this. Right. Um, at the moment, this is all handled, I say all handled by Jenkins, but these are by actually very um, handcrafted SQL files for each version, right? Mm. So uh, when I say handcrafted, these are, these are uh, SQL files that you can run multiple times. So the first time it will, let's say you're altering data or something like that, and they have like pre-qualifiers. So if you already have that, that column, it, it won't run, you know? But they're fairly, you know, handcrafted. We have pre and post deployment type type scripts. We, but they are quite. It's an area that is not quite fixed yet because you, you know you don't want to be able have, be having to run this kind of stuff on live data, right? Now the Ruby on Rails world has had something called migrations for ages. So there is now a project that I'd like to start looking at called CF Migrations by Eric Peterson, which essentially what it does is you have a CFC with two functions, uh, up and down, right? And each CFC has got a specific name. So it's like a sequence of events or how you're going up the, the chain. And the database knows what kind of version is at. So if your database is at version zero, right? It doesn't know which version it is and you've made 50 different changes, you have different CFCs with changes, it will call the up in sequence on each one of those. And the up command is to create a new table uh, to insert some data that's required and blah, 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 right? And it goes all the way up there. But now we have an environment, let's say we have a database at version 50, and that's now I've now added another file that, that needs to bring it up to 51. It just runs that, right? So that's essentially what CF migrations do. Now, of course, you can say, oops, we've run up to this. We need to move it back down to version 46 because, you know, uh, it's blown it. Each of those CFCs have got a down command, a way to back out from. So and that's basically a migration. It's an up and a down. It's like which way are you going? It's a linear versioning of, of, of the database. Um, so that's one, one thing I really want to have a look at because that, that'll 
they'll solve or maybe crystallize a lot of the functionality. And married to that is another pr project by Eric Peterson, who's a genius. You see all his projects that he, he is a machine when it comes out to, when it comes to command box and command and these projects uh, called query builder or QB, um, which is way, a way to do functional SQL. So you can do a select statement and then you can do functions around it to, to um, build queries much more fluently, which look very pretty when you're coding them much better than just big chunks of, of SQL. It's, it's a, and it's not quite ORM uh, in, any, in, in any essence, but it's um, a less verbose way of doing it. It's pretty nice. Uh, it's um, amazing. <laughs> But that's what I want to look at. I, we haven't looked at that. We haven't quite got CF migrations in there, but that's, I think that's the next stage where we'd like to go. But uh, this is a mature application. So we'd have to say, okay, we're now version one and any changes now all handled in CF migrations, um, which is. Now, yeah, no, that, that would be really cool if you got that running. So how do you deal with dependencies? Um, the dependencies are all handled by command box generally. Like we don't have that many dependencies, but we do have dependency trees. So the dependency trees is basically, you can get Docker images and that, for example, the Docker image for command box comes from, I think is dependent on the Java, the Tomcat, uh, the Java one or the Tomcat one, I can't remember. I think it's a Java one. Uh, and that's dependent on, a, on a, another specific one, and that's dependent on an Ubuntu image, right? So, like, it's basically that they have a linear sequencing. Now, one of the problems with this is that uh, we need to inject some, some of our, well, not ourselves, but the infrastructure need to do their own imaging stuff, like because they keep up to date. So they have a gold, um, uh, what are called, gold image that we then extend from to do our Docker stuff. So we've kind of copied the Docker stuff to build our own Docker image that actually depends on theirs rather than the, the, the baseline. So that's one of the things that you have to kind of look out for because you don't know which Docker images uh, everything comes from, right? So a Docker image is like, it's always at the beginning of the Docker file is from something, right? So, uh, Command box is, for example, from auto solutions slash command box, right? Um, and that will be dependent on another thing and dependent on another thing. So that's one of the things that we've had to do. We've had to like change that around a little bit. So we have our own gold master image that we extend from and the images that we create, again, um, have a, a different dependency tree. Mm. So in, in this, Mission Impossible that you did. <laughs> what what was the really impossible stuff? Uh, well, the, the the hard stuff was actually removing a lot of the uh, the schedule tasks because we had a whole dependency upon schedule tasks. So we've had to like create a, a different server that only has only one instance, right? Because we have this lovely elastic thing that can manage everything. It's fantastic. But if all of them have scheduled tasks that run at their own time, suddenly things go a little bit crazy, right? Because each mm -hmm. one of these 50 or two, or depending on how many, how many servers we have, um, you know, start sending out emails or doing whatever the scheduled tasks do, things get a little bit crazy, especially if you haven't set up all the, all the um, uh, logging of events, right? Because <laughs> now you don't know who's doing what. So it becomes a little bit crazy. So we had to like do this. Uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't feel nice. And I'm sure someone in the audience is going to tell me a better way of doing it. But we have one server that's our scheduled task server that actually then fires off tasks and just does it. So we just have like this, this lovely little single instance for a scheduled server. The other stuff is things that we still want to get right, which is like this idea of canary deployments. So do you know what a, a canary deployment uh, is? Basically, you have a version of your site running and into it, you chuck in an, a, the new version, right? And you start flowing some of the traffic towards it. And if there is no errors by whichever metric you're measuring errors, right? 
either uh, by, it goes down or, you know, or, or you have some, you know, some other way of logging those errors. And this is where logging becomes super important now. Um, if that's fine, then you start passing, you know, making all the other instances become that canary and then flowing traffic to those, you know, splitting out traffic until all of your, your instances are that version, right? That's, we're not there yet. And it's mainly because of what I said, finding out what, what defines a non-erroring state, you know, the fact that the server's down is a pretty big indicator, but you know, I'd say, <laughs> but um, sometimes it's more nuanced than that. Right. It's like, it's not behaving in the right way or whatever. Uh, the other canary. Sorry. It's a naughty canary. It's a naughty canary. It's like keeping quiet about things. It yes. shut. There's a dead, there's the dead canary. Yeah. 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 I think it ceased to be <laughs> a oh, dead it's... parrot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but there's also the naughty canary that's just not behaving well. Right. Um, yeah. the, the other area. Now, that we want... Because Sorry. you're doing the, the round robin thing, you're not doing <laughs> sticky sessions, right? Uh -huh. Your canaries can be, you know, you could be seconds and the whole thing is switched over to the new version. Sure, but how this would work out is that, I mean, we still haven't, still haven't deployed this or as of a few weeks that, that, that we're looking at this, but the intention is that you'd have a canary cluster, hmm. right? That certain clients would go onto. So you point certain the, domains to this cluster and, and that would start telling okay. you things are wrong. The and brave because, clients who like to try new versions of software. Right. And, you, and you'd get them to, and they, and they become the canaries, in fact. But right. we, we, we try to solve that. But that's not what a canary deployment is in that sense. But, uh, and the other one is the green-blue deployments in which we basically deploy a new cluster of the, the, the new version and point all the traffic back at it. People use it, but we keep the old one as a, as a as a blue, you know, until we're sure that the, that the green is working, and then we basically swap the blue out with the new version and point people to that one, and then you swap the, the other one out. So you do this kind of swapping between one and the other uh, out. So we're still looking at which was the best strategy for for this. Um, but either either way, you're looking at the logs to see is is. Is this new cluster behaving well or not? Yeah. Um, and you can also give service URLs to each of your containers, right? So um, the service URL is just a URL that, that Docker will automatically hit to say, are you alive? And it, it just expects, a, a, I think, a 200 response, right? But you can, that service URL, remember, you can script it to do anything. So you can do self-health checks. So you can say, like, no, I'm not processing as much as I should do or... or things that, you know, you could log stuff in there internally in your application structure to say like, no, I'm not behaving. Shout canary, you know. Um, like, change, so that, the news, a, change the newspaper in the bottom of the canary cage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Paper needs changing. <laughs> but yeah, so those are the things that was the hard stuff that, we are, that we're still um, working through. And, you know, clustering is hard, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's still... Um, despite my, my dig at thing, it's, it's not so much clustering is now, you know, scaling the applications out. So do you, do you think you're going to meet the mission impossible deadline when this ISP, you know, closes its data center and you switch fully to cloud? I think so. We we have a few crazy or, apps or, that we have to or, see how they behave, but yeah. or will the secretary have to disavow your actions, Mark? As in every single show of Mission Impossible, I've always, <laughs> yeah. I shall be triumphant. <laughs> be triumphant, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll do my best Leonard Nimoy impression. I think no one knows, is going to get the, the reference because I think everyone here thinks of Mission Impossible as, as Tom Cruise, but no. It's Leonard Nimoy was uh, one of the main guys in it. Yeah, he was, along with. Uh, Mr. Phelps, um, that's the right. game actor who played him. Yeah, Leonard Nimoy played played more weird characters. Yeah, he he had the mask most of it, didn't it? Yeah, he'd have that rubber mask he'd put on to pretend to be someone else. Maybe you better get your rubber mask handy just in case. You know. 
<laughs> well, if it all goes wrong, I'll have to like get my rubber mask and disappear. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sure it'll go good. So uh, comparing doing, you know, getting this stuff running in Docker on the cloud using command box to what you used to do for clusters, how, how does it compare? Is it harder or oh, easier? I think it's, it's a mental shift for one to stop thinking of, of your, your precious server as a precious server. But there's a lot of stuff that starts helping you now. There's going to be, the software is becoming better at that, like Portana and various other different um, UIs that allow you to say, oh, actually, I want to deploy it like this, and I want it to, to be uh, deployed across servers like this. So, for example, uh, Rancher is another product that you can actually say, Here's my, here are my physical servers that I have Docker on, and I'm going to deploy my environments like this. Um, and it's actually a lot easier to do that and then to then, you know, write it. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that because Docker, if I wanted to run Portainer, for example, it's a Docker image, right? All I need to know is how to run Docker. And now I can run this very complicated software that does all my deployments and orchestrations, where before I had to learn how to install it. A good example of that is like I wanted to use Redis as a cache back end, right? I don't know much about Redis. Go and have a look at the installation instructions and, and, and all the different dependencies and stuff like that. It's kind of hard to get that deployed. But now I just can start up an instance in Docker in a, in a few seconds, depending on download time. But, you know, it's literally, that's my biggest problem now, knowing the download time. And now I can go straight into the, the part of the manual of how to use it rather than how to install it. Mm. Um, so it means that you've got a massively accelerated speed of development and understanding of things um, compared to the olden days where, right, if I had a Windows machine, I'd have to click my way through the afternoon installing next, 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 next for, for SQL Server, but maybe I didn't do it right because I don't know how, what I meant. It's asking me questions at the beginning that I don't know the answers to, right? Uh, and then make sure that that ties in with my next bit of next, 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 and then an IIS, which I didn't install once I started installing Core Fusion, and then I have to go back. You know, all this kind of silliness, which I'm not doing anymore. I'm all saying, okay, right, this is these are the servers that have spun up in the cloud, and now I'm going to deploy a massive application to it. And I'm not even worrying too much about it because I've already got it running locally on Docker anyway, so I know it's going to run. I, I don't yep. care about the, the 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 bare metal or the OS underneath it. It is genius. I mean, I was talking to uh, Neil Creswell, who's one of the co-founders of Portana, uh, in an earlier episode. It's just a single oh, yeah. line to to install it, and then it can you can totally control all your images and containers right. and see it's what's fantastic. going on. And and I did actually suggest to him, you know, is there some way you could get a post mortem when a Docker container dies? So. I don't know if they'll implement that, but that would be right, yeah. very handy. Because you do get that they die, um, but it, uh, in Portana, you can then start up a, a journal D, so you can have reasons why it died. I mean, you would, Portana wouldn't get so much information about why it died, because you need to be getting the logs out from it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's just... It's just making this kind of deployment of complex environments much easier. I mean, it's quite, and it's kind of getting the idea that we can use command box, like kind of like a microservice, you know, you don't have to build these monolith applications that do everything you can, because now they're so lightweight, I can have a little million application that, that my application just calls as a URL call to go and do something. Right. And it starts up, does it and disappears and you know i don't have to be have worry about it it's genius so uh, we're gonna go to a, some slightly different questions okay so the first one is why are you proud to use cfml it just makes you really productive i mean you know you ha i've had this argument for years not argument but it's con conversations like oh you still use this and but I've had discussions with people where you say, well, CFML does this. They say, you're able to do PDFs, you're able to do mailing, you'll be able to do this and this and this. And they say, oh, yeah, but this other language does it. And you're like, yeah, 
but does it do all of this? Well, no, you have to then do this and this and this. Uh, but they say, oh, this other language does PDF really well. And I say, yeah, great, but does it do this other thing and this other thing and this other thing? And CFMR has kept up being a modern language. It's just, you know, it keeps on getting better every year. Both Adobe keep on coming up with new, new ideas for it and Lucy, the Lucy team keep on coming up with great ideas for it. Um, and still, you know, it allows me to get stuff done very easily. I don't have to worry about NPM, NPM dependencies and problems like that. You know, M, you know uh, Node is, is a very great programming language, but it can get messy without massive frameworks in the way, you know, I mean, any language can get messy. I'm not, that's, I know people are shouting at me, but it's, I can get stuff done just much quicker in, in, in CFML that's all there, right? It's just out of the box. It's productivity. It's like, it's, it's, it's delivering on, it's delivering for clients rather than messing around with frameworks for, or because it's the latest fad. Mm. So what will it take to make, what would it take to make CFML even more alive this year? Having just had a blast at NPM, I think what, <laughs> what Forgebox does and being able to stop us reinventing the wheel. I look at a lot of people's code as part of my job, as part of uh, the, the consultancy that command is. And you know, you see like the 50th version of, of a login system, of a way of checking for passwords or making sure, you know, that's just an example, but it's like, Oh my God, don't reinvent these wheels, reinvent the business problem, you know, or invent the prison, you know, the business solution uh, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel again. And Forgebox is getting very close to that. It's allowing us to configure stuff is allowing us to look at all these things. I think making more live this year is just, getting all those extensions out, getting people writing Lucy extensions that solve a problem well and people can look at it that way, you know? Um, make it more and, modular. Yeah, and I, I encourage anyone who's got some cool code, whether it's a login process or some other thing that's not, you know, it's technical, it's not related to the business directly. Right. Why not like, upload it into Forgebox, you know? Yeah, get, get, you know, get it nicely installed, you know? it will probably improve the quality of your code because I know when I make code public, I want it to actually work and look good, you know? Yeah, exactly. And if you're going to open source, especially, you now have to get rid of those blasphemous comments and, uh, and things, you know? <laughs> I should really make this work. Now you have to, you know, or make a ticket. Right. <laughs> and, and also, pe other people may give you ideas or contribute to it and improve it. So you know. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's so, more, more working with the community, more like getting your stuff out there, stop keeping it indoors, open source it, add it to forge books, make extensions, you know, answer questions on stack overflow for people, make it more live. Mm. That sounds like a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you're going to be giving two talks into the box. This I year. am you, in, in this, lovely this one in love, lovely Houston, Texas. This yeah, is just, just any, any old Texas. This is, this is proper the south Texas. of Texas. Yeah. yeah. No, it's going to be a good blast. I, I haven't been to Texas for a long time. You were um, there last year. What are you talking about? No, I wasn't there last year. No, I didn't go. Weren't last you year. there? Oh, no. okay. Um, sure, I, I talked to you in the corridor. <laughs> <laughs> must have been, a, must have been another was. guy who looked just like you. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 I wasn't there last year. Um, no, I'll be, I, I'm looking forward to it because I think this is a, f I might be wrong and it's late in the evening, but I think this is the first into the box I've been to. Oh, okay. I think I arrived late to another into the box because it was like mm. with CF objective, I think. Right. Um, a few years back. Well, CF objectives taking a break this year. So. Yeah. They needed a rest. They were all about the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, um, so into the box is the place to be. Yeah, definitely. I think this is going to take up the slack this year. You know, or step up to the podium or whatever the, the term is. Yeah. I mean, last year's was very good. Lots of great technical stuff, very inspiring. 
lots of interesting people, plenty of opportunity to talk with the speakers. And uh, they had a nice, uh, what do they call it? Happy box party. <laughs> so, a happy box party. Oh, okay. Yes. So. No, I'm really, I mean, I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking to see what the, the guys at Autis have been up to because they do incredible work. So really yeah. want to see what they've been coming up to. New version of Command Box, maybe, on yeah. the Horizon. Yeah. And the, Content Box and several other boxes, I think. Boxes, yeah. I'm quite proud. I think I gave uh, Lewis the idea to name Content Box, Content Box. I thought it was the obvious mm. solution. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that. I'm going to take that. So if, if people want to find you online or listen to your podcast, how can they do all those things? I am very easy to find. I'm markdrew.io. I'm also at markdrew on the Twitters. I keep, um, and at localhost FM on the Twitter for my podcast, which we put out once a month, roughly. Well, we don't put it out roughly smooth. It's smooth, straight out there, once a month. Great topics. You, you need to run your podcast in docker and then it would be totally smooth yeah i need to, uh, I, I need to do that i don't know how i'll do that but i'll do that i'll look into it <laughs> <laughs> well that way you could have a 50 copies of, of yourself recording different interviews all at the same yeah. time once we get cloning i'm totally there like that's the way to go <laughs> I, I can see that you'll be cloned and you'll have a docker image of yourself <laughs> As a backup. But whether you'll pass the CF lint, we're not sure. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of lint on me. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs>